All right, I think we're ready to begin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this is a great time to grab your candle if you haven't already. And I just wanna invite you to share any announcements you have in the chat. Um, I think our, our opening song is Love Makes a Bridge by Sheila Kaloran. And um, yeah, welcome, let's begin. Welcome to this morning, this day, and this opportunity to be together in community. My name is Avery. I'm a white settler, a member of this congregation, and a proud Unitarian Universalist. And today I am your service leader. My pronouns, the words you may use to refer to me, are they and them. And uh, thank you for coming this morning. Um, at the beginning of every Westwood service, we pause to situate ourselves in the place where we are now. Before settlers, including my ancestors, arrived here, there were complex societies, civilizations, and cultures built here over the span of many, many generations. Some say 10,000 years, some say many, many more. Certainly longer than any of us can fully intellectually or emotionally grasp, but a source of awe, wonder, and respect. Indigenous peoples gathered, worshiped, sang, danced, loved, lived, and died in a way unique to this place. And they still do here on this Northwestern tip of the Great Plains. A Miskuchi Waskihigan, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills House, is Treaty 6 territory. It is the traditional home of diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. We know that land acknowledgements alone aren't enough to bring about reconciliation, decolonization, or an end to the racist attitudes and beliefs about Indigenous peoples that permeate our communities. Recently, Many Indigenous young people have expressed their frustration about the use of land acknowledgements at settler ga gatherings becoming more and more of an empty gesture. Recently, I've seen folks experimenting with different practices that build on the land acknowledgement, such as a call to land liberation. It asks us to be more personal, to continue to practice, making it different every time. And it asks us to make a real commitment. I invite you to let us know in the chat, where are you? Whose traditional territory do you call home? What do you love most about the land that sustains you today and every day? The land that raised me stretches from Refinery Row in the east to a small lake in the Northwest called Lac St. Anne. The history of the original peoples where I grew up is that the Papas Chase Cree were forcibly removed from there reserve in South Edmonton through deliberate starvation. 
my cat is really interested in the service this morning. Sorry about that. Um, what I love about the land lately is its capacity for death and rebirth and change. What I hope for the land is that my grandchildren, my nieces, nephews, and nibblings will be able to drink clean water from the watershed that feeds this area. And my responsibility in decolonization lately has been to decolonize my imagination and my relationships. And this is ongoing work for all of us. Thank you for listening. Welcome each and every one of you to Westwood. As a UU congregation, we come together each week to learn more about being in relationship, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, how to create trust and compassion in one another. We're not here because we figured it out or because we think we've got it right. We come here to consider ourselves, our place, our privilege, our purpose. We come here to discover just how to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder. Thank you for joining us this morning. Our opening words today come from the Reverend Erica Hewitt with a note that this call to worship be preceded by the first three sentences of Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. As we enter into worship, put away the pressures of the world that ask us to perform, to take up masks, to put on brave fronts. Silence the voices that ask you to be perfect. This is a community of cash, compassion and welcoming, or at least we try to be. You do not have to do anything to earn the love contained within these virtual walls. You do not have to be braver, smarter, stronger, better than you are in this moment to belong here with us. You only have to bring the gift of your body, no matter how able, your seeking mind, no matter how busy, and your animal heart, no matter how broken. Bring all that you are and all that you love into this hour together. Let us worship as community. Our gathering this morning is made possible by the collective efforts of many people who are here today and also many who have come before us. Uh, today, speaking from our free pulpit is our very own Reverend Ann Barker, pronouns she, her, who serves as this congregation's minister. Thank you, Ann, in advance for your sermon. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. And I also wanna take a second to thank all of the folks working behind the scenes to make these services not only possible, but so meaningful, especially during this time of need in the world. Um, thank you to our Director of Religious Education, Youth Programs, and our technical support person, Elara Stefania Godet, pronouns they, them, and theirs, as well as our other faithful service tech, Bill, pronouns he, him. I also wanna thank the worship committee, the music advisory group, and the board, for their ongoing work in making these gatherings possible. Um, and last, I wanna thank our musicians uh, for the magic that they bring to our services. Our musicians today are our very own Rebecca P Patterson, pronouns she, her, the director of our choir, Harmonia, as well as my beloved cousin and longtime Westwood member, Sheila Cloran, pronouns she, her. When the service is over, you're invited to stay for coffee and conversation. You can stick in the main room to talk to Anne, or you can join a breakout room to talk with a smaller group of folks. And at 12.15 this afternoon, we are having a special, a special conversation as a congregation regarding the adoption of the proposed eighth principle. And you're invited to take part in that. It's a very exciting and historic moment for our democratic living tradition and your voice matters. So please stick around. 
Um, all this said, I will now pass it over to Reverend Ann to light our shared chalice. And if you have a candle at home, you're invited to do so as well. Thanks, Avery. Yeah, let's bring your candles forward or your chalices. In Wholeness, written by the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison in their new book, Breaking and Blessing Meditations. There is no competition between this light and the darkness which it holds. Both the light and the darkness are holy. We light our chalice not to defeat the darkness, but because for a time we need the gifts of flame, warmth and light to guide and help us in our endeavors. And when the time comes, we will embrace again the gentle dark, which allows us to rest. For so, and so we light this, we kindle this light with awareness and gratitude for light and dark and all that lies between, each with its gifts, each with its beauty, each a part of a sacred and necessary whole. Reverend Sean Parker Dennison is the minister at Rogue Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Ashland, Oregon, and co-founded Trust, an organization for transgender UU religious leaders in 2004. They are also an artist, parent, poet, and grandparent. And fun fact, they are the spouse of Teresa Ninian Soto. In Sean's words, once more, we kindle this light with awareness and gratitude for light and dark and all that lies in between, each with its gifts, each with its beauty, each part of the sacred and necessary whole. The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished tradition in many Unitarian Universalist congregations across Turtle Island and around the world. Through the lighting of candles, we bear witness to each other by holding space for emotion without fixing or saving. It allows us to understand each other's worlds a little better during the good times and also during times of overwhelming grief. Even when we're not gathered in person, the practice of lighting candles together helps us to be a true community. I invite you now to share your concern or celebration in the chat or light your own candle in silence. I have written 
one more or lit one more candle for all the joys and concerns that remain unspoken but present in our hearts. Please join me in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Today we have a treat from the UU Society of San Francisco, um, a video they made that is a message for all agents. What is the eighth principle? Well, you know our seven principles, right? They're things that matter to us. Things that guide how we are as a community, how we treat each other, and what we want to bring more of into the world. Just like each of us is always learning and growing, we know our principles have to grow sometimes too. This is the story of the Eighth Principle. A few years ago, some UU leaders spoke up. They told us, these principles we love, they left something out. Like many who'd come before them, they spoke about how people still aren't being treated fairly because of the color of their skin, or where they come from, or other things that make them who they are. And that happens not only in the world at large, but even in our congregations, even in this one. So we need to do more to make sure that all people can feel welcome and loved here. We need to say more about our commitments to fight against racism because racism hurts everybody. In fact, it hurts all seven of our principles. And so the eighth principle was born. The Eighth Principle is a commitment to fight against racism and oppression and to build a beloved community of love and trust and belonging here in our church and in the world around us. We're gonna be talking about the Eighth Principle a lot this spring, learning about it and what it means for this community. What does the Eighth Principle mean to you? West Unitarian Congregation is a self-governing and self-supporting congregation. We rely on donations to support our staff and the important work they do, as well as our various programs. The tradition of passing a collection plate around on Sundays is not available to us now, but imagine me passing the plate to you now. I invite you to give generously electronically in order to contribute to the shared abundance of this community. And sing along. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. People, mostly Christian people, tend to ask me, why do your people go to church if they don't believe in God? First, I explain that plenty of our folks believe in God or spirit or the transcendent power of mystery and love. It's just that God is optional because God is not our primary organizing principle. And they give me that, you didn't answer my question look. So I ask them, why do you go to church? And once they've answered, and you can imagine the multitude of answers, I reply something like, yep, 
that's pretty much why we go too. Think of all those things you love about gathering at your congregation, the music, the ideas, the people, and of course, the food. We will eat together again. And just like you, we come to learn and stretch and grow and be immersed in compassionate community. We come to explore old and new ideas and philosophies and cultural practices. We come for the singing and the poetry and the discussions and the candles. And we come for the community to be connected to something larger than ourselves, for the inspiration to be our best, most ethical selves, encouraged and spurred on by others who are muddling through their own issues and understandings. We come for a safe place to practice. We use our strength and power and collective energy to imagine a world of peace and justice and love and equality, a world that makes room for all people, a world that doesn't require a test to prove that you are worthy, but rather a world that recognizes your inherent worth and dignity, full stop. And we understand the universe to be all connected, interdependent, all life sharing the same essential resources. So we come together to lift that up to recognize, honor, and celebrate our precious planet and our precious lives. And we gather for strength and safety and hope and reassurance in the face of challenges from personal to global so that we have the wisdom and care of loving companionship through the difficult times because we all go through difficult times. It's more answer than they were looking for. And obviously, it's the wrong answer. So then I learned their real questions. But if God won't punish you, they try again. Why do you keep going? We go because life and love and community and justice are important to us, I say. And because we don't need to feel threatened to want to create an intentional life. We want to be good and kind and caring and just because we believe in our hearts and our minds that it's the right thing to do. That's it. That's all we need. Whose are we? Who do we belong to? Who are we committed to? What are the relationships that we are bound to, no matter what? This is the essential question at the heart of every political, philosophical, and religious debate. Whose are we? Is it every person for themselves? Or we take care of our own, and then you define who is our own, all the way along a scale to all of us belong to all of us. We will care for one another. You use don't have an obligatory structure calling us into relationship. We come to this place and to this service freely, each for our own reasons, each with our own unique lives and our own unique understanding of the world. We are not all the same, and there is no pledge that makes us all the same. It can seem loosey-goosey to folks who belong to a more rule-bound culture or tradition. They sincerely wonder what keeps us connected if we don't have an explicit obligation like the biblical commandments or the Buddhist precepts, if we aren't trying to avoid eternal suffering in the form of hell or achieve salvation through heaven or enlightenment if we aren't necessarily living out some instruction from a prophet or a messiah or an angel or a sage. And sometimes people think it's easy that you use can believe whatever they want, but there is more to us than loosey goosey and whatever. To be a Unitarian Universalist is complex and takes intentional effort to move outside of the container of following prescribed rules and instead to make an open-minded practice of what feels right and real.
It's serious work determining what constitutes a meaningful life, as well as understanding how to live in healthy, respectful partnership with our neighbors, our community, and our planet. We are constantly deciphering and learning, recalibrating and deepening, and we are never finished. And that can feel hard sometimes. Sometimes we wish we could just coast for a bit, that we've done a lot, we've been compassionate and caring and worked for justice and shared our wealth, and we could use a little break. Maybe, just maybe, we've got it right or right enough and we could just take a breather. And then the shit hits the fan. An issue comes to the forefront and suddenly nothing is easy. If you're a lifelong UU and you're more than 12 years old, you've already been through this. You've lived through complex governance issues, financial or relationship issues, or like now, justice issues that can challenge a congregation's equilibrium or that shake up the national movement or even the continental or the global UU community. We're no different than the wider world where these days, Everything is all shook up. Climate destruction, hate and violence, poverty and hunger, cruelty, disease, and then COVID. There is a universal sense of overwhelm. So let's pause for a breath and take a moment for me to reassure you that I'm not about to ask you to do something new something beyond your capacity or something unfamiliar. For the next couple of minutes, we're gonna lay down the obligation to solve all the problems of the universe. And instead we are going to sit with what really matters. When COVID first emerged and we were all rocked on our foundations, we had an intensely personal dose of what really matters. Each time we get a global or local or personal diagnosis of peril, and there can be any number of them, we are acutely reminded of what really matters. And just like the first question, why do we gather if we don't have to, we know that there are as many answers as there are people in this room. What really matters has become intensely obvious to each one of us. So share with me, if you wouldn't mind, what really matters. What essential gift, if you could wave your magic wand, would you provide to the world and her people? If you would type into the chat, I'll read some of them aloud without names, just the messages. What really matters. The end of inequality, marginalization, and oppression. Community coming together. Love. A healthy environment. Respect for all people and the earth, leaving the earth in good shape for the next generations. Trust, being compassionate and kind to others. It matters to come together and care for each other, caring for others and the earth, ensuring that everyone has enough, that everyone has food and shelter and freedom. Interconnection and compassion with all beings, all my relations, willing to persevere together for the good of all. These are really beautiful. Acceptance. Solidarity. Mickey Scott Bay Jones writes in the book, Holding Change, together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world 
We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. Mickey goes on to write, Audre Lorde said, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations that we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us. We must confront oppressive situations that keep us in chains. One of the ways we confront oppression is to do the concentrated work of bravely facing what needs healing on the inside, which in some strange dance of inner and outer work is revealed as we are doing the work of dismantling the larger systems of oppression. It is a both and proposition. Doing the work reveals more of the work to be done in us. The means are the ends. And if we simply confront the oppression out there, the white supremacist, capitalist, hetero, hetero patriarchal structures, and not in here ourselves, and in here our movement communities, we will only be creating more culturally familiar versions of the systems we say we want to dismantle. That's the end of the quote. The Canadian Unitarian Council Dismantling Racism Study Group, at the request of all of us, the member congregations, Canadian Unitarians, took a survey of our people. And the results are not surprising, but they are hard to read. Their final report tells us unequivocally that BIPOC folks, Black Indigenous people of color, are aware of, have witnessed, and have experienced racism in our congregations at a rate far higher than white people realize. White people also demonstrate some awareness of racism, but the BIPOC response, as you might imagine, is significantly higher. The report is important. Its findings aren't really surprising if we can admit to ourselves that we are a reflection of the broader community and not some special snowflake that is immune to social ills. That's not an insult. It's just an acknowledgement. No one is immune to the culture they are immersed in. We would all like to think we are better at inclusion than the common denominator but we still live lives that are deeply interwoven with public and private structures that were designed at their very core to keep diverse peoples apart. But now we are at a crisis point. After decades without a resolution, white people are being called in to a more intentional, careful relationship. One of the recommendations in the report is this, that Canadian Unitarians adopt an eighth principle as an explicit impression of our commitment to anti-racism. The wording suggested goes like this. With the preamble to our existing seven principles, we, the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council covenant to affirm and promote, and here's the eighth principle, individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. Let's shift direction for a few minutes and hear from some of our UU youth and young adults. A word from our young adults. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Clark. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a part of church leadership at the Unitarian Church of Montreal. The video that you are about to watch is a small representation of youth and young adults across the Canadian Unitarian Council. 
We met over the summer, but September is also a very busy time of year for us. A lot of folks are starting school or in times of transition. With acknowledgement of this time, we still wanted to communicate or get across to uh, the greater community of UUs to show how passionate we are about the eighth principle. Thank you very much for watching this. Hello, my name is Camelia Jahanshahi. I am a lifelong UU and currently work at the Unitarian Church of Montreal. Though you may have seen me in other spaces around the UU world, both here in Canada and in the United States before. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley and I wanted to share with you briefly my reflections on the proposed eighth principle. Hi, my name is Alara Stefaniuk Gadet and my pronouns are they and them. I'm when I think about the eighth principle, I think about relief. Relief because I am exhausted. I am exhausted because I am a mixed person of color in a predominantly white space who has, for my entire life, been fighting for more diversity and inclusion and compassionate nuance around BIPOC issues in our UU worlds. As I have to continuously explain why it's important to protect and uplift and make a commitment towards anti-racism and anti-oppressive opinions, ideologies, and policies within this faith. I'm fully supportive of the Eighth Principle. I do hope it passes in November, um, but I have a lot of apprehension about the amount of time and energy that's been focused specifically around the Eighth Principle and really hoping that regardless of what happens in November, we move beyond um, just that piece, that there are other recommendations that the Dismantling Racism Study Group report um, suggested. And then also, you know, just like that individual congregations are sort of um, assessing and analyzing where we can all um, do some of this work. I grew up in this faith and as much as I love it and as much as I am passionately committed to the beautiful possibilities of our faith, I'm also tired and I started to get tired much, much sooner than I should have. You know, I was tired when I was 12 and explaining that I don't know why people in my culture are angry. I know why I'm angry. <laughs> um, if we, a predominantly white community, are not creating a space where POC feel welcome, comfortable, and supported, then how can we justifiably for our spiritual practices from those same communities uh, without a commitment to dismantle racism in ourselves and racist structures within the UU community is our religion not simply founded on cultural appropriation and exploitation. Unitarian Universalism is a li living tradition. Um, over the last year, I've learned a lot about how the first seven principles came to be, um, what some of the tensions and conversations and processes were for those to become the principles that we currently have. Um, and it inspires me that uh, this tradition is uniquely situated to be self-reflective, to be adaptive, to continue to better ourselves and be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. Um, and I, I think that's true for, for this um, this area of work as well. I'm contributing to this video today because I very strongly believe that there is no justice in silence and that the eighth principle is one way that we can collectively raise our voices as a beginning step to speak against the silence that comes with racism. Since I've read it, it sort of stuck with me from the Dismantling Racism Study Group report about the gap between who we say we are uh, with our Unitarian Universalist uh, principles and the lived experience of everyone entering into our doors. Um, and so I think my apprehension is that uh, even if the eighth principle is uh, included and we have that on our signage, on our websites, in our welcomes and introductions, um, it's all 
well and fine and and until it's not an actually lived experience for somebody and somebody comes into our congregation expecting that and um, is let down or disappointed so i do really hope that congregations take this opportunity to really say and then what what's next how do we do this work i'm grateful for you listening to this video and for you taking the words of our youth and young adult communities seriously as we advocate for the adoption of this new principle and for our faith movement to walk forward or move forward in the direction of social progress as we have in the past in other movements that we've seen led by youth young adults and marginalized or BIPOC people within our communities. Just holding you all in love and compassion um, and uh, looking forward to connecting over the next weeks, months, and years. So thank you for listening. And I hope that hearing these voices helps you move forward with us. To be completely honest with you, I had this one all wrong. And that's a symptom of my cultural biases. I thought the eighth principle would be an obvious yes. And I've been surprised by the pushback and the resistance. I've been surprised by the criticism and the unkindness of people's language. I've been surprised by the escalation of harms. In spaces where a person of color has expressed their hurt and concern, I have witnessed white people responding with, not in my congregation, I don't see it. And the BIPOC people retract a little bit more again. Individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our congregations. It makes sense to me that we have questions and that we have concerns and that we don't know how we are going to live out this principle. But isn't this true of the first seven principles as well? That's our life's practice to figure it out, to push back when necessary, but to still do the work individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. It makes sense to me that folks are a little unsettled with how this principle differs from the first seven because it literally calls us to a specific action rather than being a philosophical value statement that implies a response. The word action has been a sticking point, and accountably. And the word our, as in ourselves and our institutions, has been a problem too. And this has really surprised me. I welcome the call to action and to accountability. I'm starving for it. The closer we get to living the principles we profess, the closer we are to our own integrity, the more peace we will know in our lives and in our communities and in the world. I hear our BIPOC and other marginalized folks bravely saying that their friends and family have left, that they don't feel safe bringing new people into our space until we have done some of this necessary work to learn more about what it is that we do not see, to understand some things that we do not yet understand. And I feel moved and honored that these people who answered the survey have stuck with us this long. I wanna meet their courage with willingness to meet their perseverance with evidence that their struggle and suffering has not been in vain. Nobody, is saying that we are cruel or bad people. The report is saying that we still have a lot to learn about being welcoming and inclusive. Our BIPOC folks, not strangers, but those already among us 
are asking us to do this important learning, asking us to please, for all of our sakes, learn to recognize why it is that some people feel unwelcome or unsafe. It's not because anyone here today wants anyone to feel unwelcome or unsafe. I know that about every one of us. The behaviors and experiences at issue are things that come out of our ignorance or our lack of understanding. It's a kind of accident, if you will. But once they've been pointed out, they can't be accidents anymore. Culture change is hard and slow and intentional work. We have to choose to do it because it won't happen by accident. And the eighth principle is a statement saying we choose to do it. It has been asked, why don't we just do a program like Welcoming Congregation to deal with racism instead of naming it as a principle? And it's been stated that the eighth principle is already covered in the first seven. And that may be true philosophically, but it hasn't been enough yet. Unitarians and Universalists were present at the march in Selma and we've still been struggling with symptoms of racism for as long as we have existed. Because it's a part of our entire culture. How could we not? This needs a commitment larger than an optional program. And there are disagreements about how to understand the eighth principle, how to do the work, but at the core, the point our BIPOC folks are making is that we have been asked we have been told and we have not yet explicitly learned the lessons. We're working toward it. We have been for years, but it has not been intentional enough. And we ask and we wonder, why do we not have more diversity? But when our BIPOC folks answer, we argue back. The time to argue has passed. I think about all the learning we've done as UU communities coming out of the truth and reconciliation hearings to understand our relationships, our responsibility to the indigenous peoples of this country. Whose are we? Do we not also belong to the land and to the people? I think about all the learning that has been done as individuals to recognize racism and oppression and cruelty and bias, to unlearn harmful cultural constructs and to stretch beyond our own comfort zones in pursuit of community and global healing. Do we not also belong to the world? I think, sorry, now, I said that my surprise was a symptom of my cultural biases, and this is what I mean. I grew up in a home with no shortage of anything essential. I was safe and loved. I mean, as safe as you can be in real life. And I lived in a community of abundant privilege. I was re raised to believe that you can be anything you want to be. And I was surrounded by people who professed their love and caring for the world and all its inhabitants. I had very little exposure to the depth of suffering that marginalized people experience daily. And I have always, always had the opportunity to catch my breath. So at my core, I have an expectation that things will work out that people will go the extra mile for one another, that when faced with a choice, people will ask themselves what really matters most here. And for the most part, that will govern their actions. I'm not a fool. I know how Pollyanna that may sound, but that is my cultural bias because for the most part, people of wealth and privilege do get what they want. And in this world, white skin is wealth and white skin is privilege. Even when I have been extremely poor, this has proven to be true. 
So to close this sermon, I offer you instead of mine, the words of someone with direct lived experience of what it is to be a black woman in the Unitarian Universalist faith. These words come from the darkness divine, a loving challenge to my faith, written by the Reverend Dr. Kristen L. Harper, minister of the Unitarian Church of Barnstable, Massachusetts, where she has served for 18 years. Many faith communities, including my own, have made tremendous strides in our justice work. They are following the lead of marginalized communities, becoming allies where possible and showing up when asked. However, there are generations of mistrust to cross and continued white supremacist thinking to shed before authentic relationships can grow and survive. As I said nearly 20 years ago in my sermon, Bridges Go Both Ways, the first thing we so often fail to do is building bridges that go both ways, bridges of friendship, bridges of relationships, of trust and honesty, of accountability and reconciliation. This is what is so hard, BIPOC and white people learning to trust one another, be with one another, truly care for, and be committed to one another. Here is her poem entitled, It Begins With. It begins with knowing your biases, your stereotypes, your assumptions, your judgments, and how to set them aside and receive the person who is in front of you, not the one you think you know. It begins with owning your power and privilege, your position and your comfort, and being willing to let it go. It begins with truly looking at one another, noticing that not all black and brown people look alike, are alike, believe alike, experience or react alike. It begins with reaching out, making the first move, offering the first invitation for coffee or tea or a walk in the park or a trip to the museum. It begins with hello, not a touching of hair or bodies, just hello. It begins with curiosity about our full lives, not about the hard experiences, not if black and brown skin burns in the sun, not about dreadlocks or braids or straight black hair. It begins with listening, not constantly centering yourselves, but to whatever is shared, whatever is believed, whatever is meaningful, whatever might connect. It begins with attention to your words, your language, your expressions, and the impact they have without dismissing or belittling. It begins with understanding, not making judgments about Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, humanist, or earth-centered faith, understanding that there are many ways to believe, all valid, all restorative, all equal. It begins with accompaniment, following, not leading, learning, not teaching, supporting, not just talking. It begins with commitment, to stay with each other through the discomfort and anger, to bridge the barriers, to build trust. It begins with accepting the joy and the challenges, the quirky or protective actions, the need for space where you may not be allowed to follow, the need for distance, that you may not be able to bridge. It begins with believing the experiences so foreign from your own, the daily fights for dignity, the trauma of a life of surviving the gauntlet of hate and ignorance, the mixture of laughter and tears, passion and sorrow. It begins whether a relationship, a friendship or a partnership, it begins with you. May we listen with open hearts and open minds to our siblings in faith. May we work to create brave space, places where we can muddle through necessary mistakes that help us to learn and grow into new relationships. May we build bridges that go both ways. Blessed be and amen.
Our benediction is again by Sean Dennison from the new book, Breaking and Blessing. And it's entitled Benediction. At this moment of ending, may there be a good word, a blessing to help us remember what we have so often forgotten. May the message we need be gently spoken and held in the spaces in our cells, the fibers that hold all, that hold all we need to maintain, our gentleness, our courage, and our hope. At this moment of ending, may the goodness we wish for ourselves and each other, this community, ecosystem, plant, and stardust galaxy become such a part of us that we cannot tell where the blessing ends and we begin. We extinguish our chalices in the spirit of this blessing, in the spirit of what really matters. May we carry the inspiration of today's poetry, music, and precious flames with tenderness, courage, and love. Blessed be. Our closing song this morning is Turn the World Around, performed by Sheila Cloran. Thank you to Sheila for that wonderful song that we all remember. I think it's a Harry Belafonte classic. All the beauty. Thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, we invite you to stay for coffee and conversation. Next week, um, Dawn Smith is our guest speaker and the topic is Indigenous Community Planning, How to Be Good Neighbors on a Long and Winding Road. She just completed a program um, in this area. So I'm really excited to hear what Dawn has to say, and I hope you can be with us.